Today I'm going to be talking about right there, suddenly season. Look at somebody say suddenly season. When I was growing up, like I think in the early 90s, there was a TV show and it was called Suddenly Susan. Uh, but this, this morning we're going to be talking about suddenly season, suddenly seasons. Check this out. So I, I remember when I was in like junior high, uh, I would always get in trouble. Like I was always in trouble for talking and just whatever, right? So I remember one, one time I was like sitting in class and I'm talking to my friend and my teacher's like, hey, you go sit over there by yourself in this desk, like in the corner. So I sat there by myself and I started singing that Celine Dion song. You know that Celine Dion song, All By Myself? So I was talking to my, my friend. She tells me to sit in the corner and I start singing All By Myself. And she looks at me, she's like, get out. And immediately I get kicked out of class and uh, Jordan Saka, I don't know if they hear the Saka family who goes here, uh, like I just started coming to this church. I just started going to that school and we went to the same school together and she was like a dean's aide or something like that. And so I got kicked out, went to the dean and she was there and so she would always laugh because I was constantly in the dean's office. But what the teacher didn't understand is that I was created to talk. She was trying to silence me. Don't silence me, teacher. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You gotta be quiet in class. You gotta listen. You gotta listen. That's important. I wish I would have done it different in school for sure. I'm gonna tell you guys a quick story and then we're gonna hop into this. I told a few of you guys this story, but my son plays soccer. He loves playing soccer. He plays indoor soccer. Uh, he played baseball, and then he played basketball, but he really loves soccer. Like, that's his thing. He, like, he's all about it. He loves it. Uh, and so he's been playing for a while, and he plays indoor soccer. So, uh, and Kristen's son, Grayson, plays on the same team, and Jag, my nephew, does. Uh, and so we would go and watch them play soccer every Saturday. Every Saturday, there's a soccer game. And so we go, and if you've never been to the indoor like soccer thing, it looks like a hockey rink, but it has turf on the inside, and on one end there's a goal, and on the other end there's another goal, a net, right? And, but my kids are young, so they play like sideways. They play the width of the field, and they put like barriers up to separate it, so there's like multiple games happening on one field. And so I would, as like, you know, just a loving father, I would always stand at one side of the net so that he could hear me just yelling at him all the time. You know, just like trying to spur my son on to good works, trying to encourage him, whatever it is. And so I would stand at that net and I would just constantly be like, JJ, wake up, get that ball, man, get that soccer ball. Don't let her push you around, she's a girl. Like just constantly, <laughs> constantly yelling and screaming, con like nonstop. I thought I was the coach, like no joke. I thought, dude, I'm the coach, man. I'm gonna do this, you know what I'm saying? So I would stand there all the time and just scream at him. So one day, one Saturday, like we're, we're at the game, doing like our normal like soccer routine. And while I'm there, my sister-in-law, Isabel, she comes up to me and she's like, you know what, you're being mean. I was like, being mean, what? What are you talking about? You know what I mean? So she tells me that I walk away and in my head, I'm like, being mean, I'm trying to raise a man here. This is man's business. I ain't trying to raise a little girl. You know what I'm saying? Like in my mind, I like start getting all ghetto real quick. I'm like, this is a man's job. I'm trying to raise a man. You know what I'm saying? Get out of here. So I walk away. I'm like, man, she doesn't know what she's talking about. She's a psychologist, runs a counseling center. What does she know? So I walk away, whatever. Has her master's, I don't care. I walk away and I'm like, man, I don't think she knows what she's talking about. So I go to my father-in-law and I'm like, hey, Papa G, can I ask you something? Like, I, I really need your, your advice on something. He's like, yeah, yeah, ask me anything. What is it? I'm like, do you think at these soccer games that I'm being mean? He looks at me, he's like, you want to know the truth? I'm like, yes, I do. Thank God. Another man, we get it. We know what's up. We know what's up. So I ask him, he's like, yeah, you know what? I do think you're being me. I'm like, oh, another one, another one. What does he know? He's a psychologist. You know what I'm saying? So I start like really getting bothered by it because everything inside of me, all of my intentions were like, man, I want my son to succeed. I want to cheer him on. But it was coming across as like angry, I guess. You know what I mean? So I drove off that day and my son went with my mom. Uh, and he was hanging out with her. And so I, I'm by myself for running an errand. I'm really like thinking about this. I'm like really bummed. I'm like, man, I messed up. Like I'm that dude who goes to church on Sunday, but on Saturday I'm like screaming at my kids and then trying to invite people to the Easter play. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, can you imagine like, wake up, man, don't let her push you. Hey, come to the Easter play. It's going to be great. Love you. See ya. You know what I mean? And so I'm constantly like doing all these things and I'm thinking in my car, like, man, did I blow it? Well, I started thinking about it. I'm like, you know what? I think that they're right. I think they're right. I think they're noticing a blind spot or something that's inside of me that I didn't realize was there. And so I call my son. He's five years old. I call my son because he's with my mom. And I'm like, hey, JJ, listen, man, I got to ask you for forgiveness, dude. I'm so sorry, man. Like, you know how, like, when I scream at your games all the time? He's like, yeah, of course I 
I'm like, dude, I'm not going to do that anymore, man. I'm, I'm going to go to your games. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to be so quiet, dude. I'm just going to, I'm going to let your coach coach you. That makes sense. I'm going to let your coach coach you. And so the next Saturday we go to the game and on the way there, I was driving him there. It was just him and I, I'm like, JJ, man, I want you to know a few things. I'm, I'm already proud of you. No matter what you do, just have fun, man. Listen to your coach, all these things. So we get to the game. I sit there. I did nothing. I just sat there. There's times where I was like, oh, like kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, but I, but that game, he was a completely different player. Like immediately he turned it around. There was a time where like, cause he's so young, sometimes he'll play goalie, sometimes he'll play offense. He's playing goalie one time, he gets the ball out and then he like starts doing this. He like starts beating his chest. I'm like, what in the world? This guy is like, he's turning into a little thug. He's just like, mm. He's getting all psyched, and he, honestly, that Saturday, he killed it. He, like, just dominated. He did great. And so I go, and I, I, I meet him at the door where he's running out of the field. I'm like, JJ, man, what a great game, dude. Good job. And he looks at me in my face, and he tells me, I told you, man, if you just be quiet, I'll play a lot better. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? One week, suddenly, immediately, he was a different player. So this morning, we're talking about suddenlies. We're talking about immediately. And we're going to hop into the scripture. If you got your Bibles, go to John chapter 6, verse 16 through 21. John 6, verse 16 through 21. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to start reading it to you. John 6, 16 through 21, it says, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat and say this next word with me, and immediately the boat was at land where they were going. So Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, thank you that your spirit, your presence is already in this place. God, thank you that you're already working. You're already moving. God, thank you for your presence uh, during worship. God, and I pray that you would speak to our hearts, you would open our hearts, God, that you would give me the right words to say, God, that you would fill me with your spirit. And God, I pray that we would, after this message, after this sermon, we would be able to step into seasons of suddenlies. God, that we would step into Kairos divine moments, divine opportunities. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this scripture, right, they're in the middle of a storm. How many of you guys ever been in a storm before? I grew up in Hawaii and there was one time where we were like in a hurricane. It didn't like hit us hard, hard, but the side of that hurricane came by and I just remember we taped our windows. It was raining like sideways. It was windy. Like as a kid, I still remember like it didn't hit us real hard, but the hurricane like its effects came right through where we were living. You, hear, you know what I'm saying? So how many of you guys, not only like natural storms, but like in life, you feel like, man, I've been through some tough times. I've been through some hard times. I've been through some really, really, really tough times. So in the middle of a storm, I wrote down the definition. It's a violent disturbance of the atmosphere with strong winds and usually rain, thunder, lightning, or snow. So many of us are living in these places where there's a disturbance of our atmosphere. It changes our attitude. It changes the way we function, the way we operate, the way we do life, the way we are, live our marriages, the way we take care of our kids. It's these storms that we live in that's insane. You guys ever see that TV show, Storm Chasers? These are like the craziest people. What they do is this, is they get in a car, like a RAV4, or like a Toyota, I don't know what it is, and they start driving and there's like four of them, they got computers and stuff with all the technology and they're like, all right, there's a tornado like 100 feet off, 100 yards away, whatever it is. And they're like, it's ripping roofs off of houses, it's killing puppies, it's throwing kids around. And they're like, we're going to drive right into it. They're like, the, I mean, the craziest people, they're like, we're going to drive right into that tornado. It's crazy. It's crazy. So many of us live in these places of storms, live in these places where we don't know what to do. Hard times, hard places. And this is what I believe. We're going to talk about this. I'm going to kind of give you the, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about storms from John chapter 6. And then after that, we're going to talk about how we start stepping into seasons of suddenlies, how we start stepping into immediately 
hear what I'm saying? So storms, I believe, happen in our lives because they reveal what's really in our hearts. Storms happen because they reveal what's really inside of our heart. You know, sometimes you'd be, you could be at church and you're worshiping and you're doing all these things. You're getting touched. God's transforming your heart. You're crying. You're singing whatever song you're singing. And then you go to the, the gym or whatever and some guy looks at you wrong. You're like, what's up? I'm trying to catch these hands, bro? I'm trying to catch these hands? Right? But at church, you're just like getting blasted. What happens from that point to you trying to catch these hands? You know what I mean? It's because we're in these, it's in these times that really reveals, whoa, something's in our heart, right? And people looking at us like, man, that guy loves God, but he's angry. Oh man, that dude loves God, but he's real mad. You know what I mean? There's something that happens in storms that I believe sometimes only storms can produce, only tough times can produce is, whoa, that's what's really in my heart. You know, I started doing these things. Uh, I started reading this book, and they encourage you to, like, write every morning. It's called Morning Pages. And they're like, write three pages without stopping, and whatever comes to your, your mind, write it down. And so I started doing that, just like, I'm going to be like David. I'm a psalmist, you know? So I started writing stuff down. But what I realized is when I write things down without thinking about it, I started to realize what was really inside of my heart. And so I would just write down unfiltered, un whatever, and just like, and things would come out. Oh, I'm like, and I would start looking at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am not happy, right? I am angry at that, or whatever it is. And so I'd start to deal with those things and say, God, man, thank you for showing me this because now I know that's in my heart. See, when you're in storms, that's what happens. It starts to show you, man, this is what's really going on. You ever meet a couple that just starts dating and they're like super happy and nothing can go wrong? He's the best guy ever. And they like skip and stuff. She's so beautiful. You don't get it. She's amazing. Well, a question I, I'll ask them is, have you been in a fight? And if they're like, no, nah, we've never been in a fight, then I'm like, it ain't real, dude. It ain't real until you fight that person. I'm not talking about like literally like fist fighting somebody. I'm talking about until you actually get into a fight with someone, you don't know what they're like. I mean, honestly, ladies, listen to me. There is a lot of guys out there who could win an Academy Award for the acting that they do when they start dating you. For real. Hey, they could win an Oscar. And the Oscar goes to that dude right there who's been faking it for a year trying to get that girl. Oh, uh, thank you so much. It's been a lot of work. Uh, it's taken so much dedication. Right? They could win an Academy Award for all the acting that they're doing. But when you get into a fight with somebody, when you get into a storm with somebody, when you push them, all of a sudden it's like, whoa, that's who they really are. If I were you ladies, I would be all, I would be messing with guys nonstop until who they really are comes out. Push that fool. Push him. Just push him. But it's in those times, it's in storms that your true self, your true heart, what your real motives are comes out. I believe that's why we're in storms. So let's, let's look at it. If you're looking at your Bible, John chapter six, like I said, number one, when you're in a storm, the first thing I believe that, it, that happens is it's hard to have vision in a storm. It says when they got on the ocean, it was already dark. You see that? It was already dark. You ever walk around your house in the dark? Like all the lights are out. Like you gotta like tip. You don't, I don't like just start sprinting in my house in the, in the pitch black. Now I know Bruce Springsteen liked to dance in the dark, but when I'm in the dark, I tiptoe. I'm careful, I'm cautious, right? When you're in a storm, lots of times the first things that starts to go is your vision. And when you got fresh vision, that's exciting. That's energy. I got energy, right? And so when you get that vision, when you have fresh vision, you're excited about it. But when you get into these tough times, it's really hard to see where you're going, what you're doing. What's the next step? I, I don't know. I have to, everything is slow. Everything is careful. It's cautious. I have to be careful that I'm not just like whacking my shin into the stairs somewhere. You have to take your time. And that's a frustrating place. How many of you guys, like when you get up, you're like ready to run and gun. You're ready. I, I want to get stuff done. I'm ready to roll. Some people are like that. And if you're like that, this is a super frustrating place for you to be in because you got to take your time. And it's in these places where I feel like you have no vision. And you know, the Bible says, if you have no vision, you cast off restraint. People perish because they have no vision. 
See, this is a place where you have to be and, and when you're like, God, I don't know what the next step is. I can't even see what's in front of me. I don't even know where to go. In these places, you have to get it in your heart and say, God, even if I don't understand, even if I don't see it, I trust you. In the middle of these storms, this is where you have to get this place in your heart where it's like, even if I don't feel you, even if I don't see you, I already know what you've done for me and I trust you. But in the beginning, when you're in these storms, in these tough times, it's hard to have vision. It's hard to have fresh vision for your life, for your wife, for your kids, whatever it is, for your job. That's one of the first things I, I feel like you start to hit is no vision. Number two, in storms, the temptation is to feel like Jesus doesn't care. He's abandoned you. You know, it says it was already dark and Jesus had not come yet. When you're in these tough times, it's easy to feel like, God, where are you at? Where are you at? I'm doing everything I know how to do, and you're not here. You don't care about me. God, I'm in this tough time. I don't have the answers, and you're not answering me. You're not speaking to me. You're not showing me. You're not telling me what I need to know. And then you like, start throwing those pity parties like, oh, God, where are you? Where are you at? And your voice gets all high, and you start crying. But it's in these times too, the same thing. You have to find a resolve in these storms and these times where I don't feel you, I don't see you, I don't know where you're at, God, but I know that the Bible says that you will never leave me. You'll never forsake me. So even though I don't know what's happening, even though I don't know why I'm in this season, why I'm in this storm, you're around somewhere. You know you care, because the Bible says, cast your cares on me for I care for you. God, I know that you care. I'm going to trust you in this time. I'm going to trust you in these storms. The third thing, in storms, we begin to feel overwhelmed. You know, it says in the scripture, the sea arose because of a great wind. I, I, I'm originally from Hawaii, and so we moved here like 20 years ago, and when we went back for the first time, I think it was like nine years later, uh, I think something like that, we went back, and me and my dad are like, this is my dad right here, by the way. He's amazing. He's awesome. Um, yeah, he's awesome. He's a good dad, but now that I'm older, he's also like one of my best friends. And that's a really cool thing to like when you get older and all of a sudden your dad is your friend. That's really cool. So we go back to Hawaii and he's like, him and I are like, man, let's go to the beach. Of course, you're in Hawaii. You got to go to the beach. You know what I mean? So we're like, let's go to the beach. We're going to hit up the beach. And so we go uh, and you guys ever see Shark Week? Shark Week, you know, like sometimes, it, like when you see, like it's in South Africa or all these crazy beaches, and there's signs in front of the beach that say like, great white sharks are swimming in this water. You know what I'm saying? So we go to this beach in Hawaii, it's called Sandy's, um, and it is rough. Like if you're from Hawaii, even like native Hawaiians have like hard times swimming in that beach, right? I haven't been back in like nine years. And so we go back and we body surf there. And the picture... Uh, like when you walk, before you go to Sandy's, there's a sign and there's a wave like this and there's a stick figure falling off the wave and it says, dangerous shore break. So like, be careful, you know? We're like, man, we haven't back, been back here in forever. Let's hit this beach up. So we hop in and my dad's like a real strong, strong swimmer. Like he's a good swimmer. I'm like decent. I can like barely swim. And so we get in there, we get in the beach and we're like catching waves, we're body surfing, we're having a good time. Well, I catch one wave, and all of a sudden, I am that stick figure on that sign. I'm like this. I'm on, on the top of the wave, and I'm getting just bucked off of it, and it says shore break because it drops you on the shore, and then it sucks you back in because the current's so strong. So I get dropped on the shore. All the wind gets knocked out of me, and then I get sucked under. So I'm trying to hold my breath, but the wind just got knocked out of me, and I'm like in this washing machine, and I honestly thought, I came back here to die. I am dead. This is where I was born, and this is where I am going to die. And I'm under there. I, it felt like a long time. I'm getting tossed back and forth, back and forth. So finally, I feel like I'm 20 feet deep. And finally, with everything I have inside of me, all of like the last of my strength, I like force, my, like force myself up. And by the time I push myself up, it had spit me back out. And so I come out, I'm like, oh! And the water's like this deep. I'm like six foot four. I, I whoa! this deep and my dad's in the water he's dying he thinks it's the funniest thing 
My son almost died. <laughs> and I'm just standing in the shore, like, like looking like an idiot. No, I promise, I'm Hawaiian. <laughs> Spits me out, and I'm standing there like, I honestly thought, this is it, I'm dead. This is it, I'm done. See, but what happens in storms is that we start to get in these tough places, these tough times, and they look so much bigger. We start to take our eyes off of God, and we start looking at these things, and we're saying, no, this is bigger. This is bigger than God. This is bigger. You understand what I'm saying? You get in these times, and your eyes shift from here. God, you're so big. You're so great. There's nothing impossible for you. And then we get in these times, and it's like, how are we going to get out of here? This is too big. This mountain is too big to climb. I can't get over this. I can't figure this out. I don't know how to fix my marriage. I don't know how to take care of my kids. I don't know how to get out of this debt. It is too big. And we take our eyes off of how big God is. It's in these tough places, in these tough times, that we find ourselves changing our eye set, our gaze, and looking down here and making it so much bigger than it really is. You know, the fact is that there's nothing too big for God. That dude split this, I mean, he did all, read the Bible, he does the craziest stuff. He's like a constantly like mic dropper, Jesus. I'm gonna split the seat. I'm gonna heal that blind person. Oh, you're dead? You're alive now. <laughs> Jesus is a, the man. Nothing is too big for him. Come on. He's constantly making things that are impossible, possible. When you're in a storm, you cannot get caught up on how big the storm is. Get caught up on how big God is. Nothing is impossible for him. Nothing is too big for him. Think about that thing that you feel like, man, it is too big. And look, start to look at God and say, you know what? This isn't too big for you, God. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of this, but I know you do. Come on, look at someone and say, he's big. Number four. I can, no, seriously, guys, that beach is rough. Don't go there. If you go there, do not swim there. Swim in the pool. <laughs> Ain't no waves. <laughs> Ain't no waves there. Number four, we start trying to take things into our own hands. It says this, that they, they rode for three or four miles. Last year, a couple years ago, this guy, I met him through Mike Lighty. Uh, Mike and I started working out with this guy, and he does CrossFit. Uh, he's a super cool guy. And so he started training me like for a couple months and we we're doing CrossFit, which if you don't know what CrossFit is, it's basically torture. It's basically like, hey, come into this hot room with pads on the ground and I'm going to torture you for an hour or whatever. It's like, it's hard stuff. It's circuit training, it's intervals. And so we go in there and I'm training with this guy for a while, like a couple months. Uh, and I go there. I remember this. It was September 11th and I go to work out with him. Uh, and I get in there and it's like a little bit different than it normally is on that day. And so on these days, like Memorial Day, Veterans Day, September 11th, they do things called hero workouts, which is like, hey, this is already tough and you're already getting tortured, but we're gonna up it this time. It's gonna be worse because they wanna do like, okay, all the people who fought for our country and died for our country, we're gonna honor them by just beating our bodies even harder, you know? So I go there on September 11th, and it was a hero workout. And James probably knows about this because he does CrossFit. And Karen and Danielle, they know about this. And so we start doing it, and there's these row machines that I've only seen, like, in CrossFit gyms. Uh, and it's like you pull it, you sit on the thing, and you pull it, and it's like a fan. And so you're pulling, like, this fan. So every time you pull it, it's like, you know? And so you're just constantly doing that. And so I'm working out, we do this circuit, it's insane, but the last part of the circuit is like, you have to roll, I think it was like 2,000 meters or something insane, something crazy. I'm like, are you serious, this is the most insane thing ever. So I start rowing, rowing, rowing at the very end, there's like sprints and then there's wall balls and there's all these things and then the very end is row 2,000 meters. And so I'm doing that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And it was super, super hard, it was tough. And so we look at this scripture and it says they rowed for three to four miles. This isn't like some merrily, 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 merrily life is, no. This was in a storm they had to row, you know? And have you ever rowed a, a boat or a canoe? Or, that's like hard work if you're really pushing that thing. And so they're rowing three to four miles in a storm. When we get into these tough times and these storms, our natural reaction at times is to, I'm gonna do this on my own. God, I don't know where you're at, 
I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make something happen. Now, I'm not telling you to lay down on the ground until God does something. I'm not telling you to just do nothing. But what I am saying is be strategic. Pray, man. Start to get into a place. Surround yourself with people who are going to encourage you, build you up, teach you, show you. I am saying is that when we get into these places, the temptation is for us to take it all on ourselves and try to make something happen. But that only leads to exhaustion. It only leads to us burning out. Eventually, we get to this place where it's like, man, I can't row anymore. I can't do anymore. This is too hard. See, there's something beautiful that happens. And, and next month in youth, we're going to talk about uh, this theme. Uh, we're calling it wave, white flag. We're calling it wave the white flag. What does that mean? It means that there's something beautiful about coming to a place of, God, I don't have what it takes. I surrender. I don't have everything that I need to do it. I surrender. There's something beautiful that happens when you get to a place in your life where you're able to just wave that flag and say, God, I surrender. I don't have, there's been so many times in my walk with God, I'm, I'm still a young man, but so far there's been so many times where the opportunity has come where something is too big, seems too big, and I understand, God, I'm not enough. I need more of your spirit. I need more of your presence. I can't continue to be the youth leader that I am. I can't continue to be the husband that I am. I can't continue to be the father that I am unless you fill me with more of your spirit. And there's these times where you get to these places where you're either going to run away because it's too hard or you're going to get lower and say, God, I surrender. I need your spirit. I need your presence. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. I don't know how we're going to figure out this storm. God, but God, I surrender to you. God, that you fight my battles for me. God, that you never leave me into a place where I can't overcome, where you don't ever leave me into a place where I don't have victory. So you got to get to this place in the middle of these storms where just get to a place where, God, I surrender. I don't have what it takes. And in my weakness, you are strong. And I wrote this down. I, I feel like this is really cool. When you've done everything you know how to do, let go and let God do everything he knows how to do. In storms... When you've done everything you know how to do, let go and let God do everything he knows how to do. There's something beautiful that happens when we just, ah, I don't have what it takes. God help me. Something amazing that happens in that posture. Number five, they finally see Jesus, but they're afraid. Here's the thing. I really believe that God shows up, Jesus shows up so many times in places that were most fearful. I believe Jesus comes to us and the answer so many times to our storms are the places that we're most afraid of. The places we're afraid to step into. And I feel like this, like so many times the things that you're called to are the things at first that you're afraid of. In storms, you go through these times, but I feel like when you get to a certain point of being in that storm, that Jesus will show up to you in a place that you're afraid of. Maybe it's going back to school. Maybe, maybe Jesus is in that place of, hey, you need to go back to school and you're afraid to do it. Maybe Jesus is waiting for you in a place where you need to go to counseling and fix your marriage. Maybe Jesus is waiting, for, you know, whatever your place is, maybe it's a fear of failure that, that you have or a fear of rejection. Whatever your fear is, you have to face that fear. Life to me isn't finding what you want to do and just doing it. That's part of it. But I also believe being successful in life has so much to do with, I'm afraid of that, I'm going to go, I'm going to go towards it. I'm afraid of stepping into this, I'm going to do it. Now, that doesn't mean like, you know, I'm afraid to, uh, whatever, get jumped by. I don't know what, it, you got to be smart, obviously. But sometimes the things that you're afraid of is what God's calling you towards. And I feel like so many times in storms, your fears are revealed. Man, I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid to do that. I'm afraid to step into that. I'm afraid to walk into that. I'm afraid. What if I fail? What if I fall? I'm afraid of that thing. And Jesus is waiting there. I'm here. This is where I'm at. This is where I want to meet you in the place you're most afraid. Because why? Jesus doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And when you encounter his love, all of a sudden his perfect love casts out all fear. And all of a sudden the thing that you were afraid of, all of a sudden you're walking on top of that thing. You're standing on that mountain. In storms, I believe our fears are revealed. All right, now let's, let's kind of, so those are the things I feel like that happen in the storm according to John 6, right? Now verse 21, it says, they willingly received him into the boat and immediately the boat was at land where they were going. As a church, as a community, I believe this is a season we're in. 
I believe the season we're in is we're in this storm, we're in a tough time. Jesus, us as Christians, we'd be willing enough to let Jesus in our boats and immediately we're on the other side. I believe we're in a season where suddenly things are gonna start to happen when we let Jesus into our boat. We would get to the places that we're supposed to go that we were destined to be. See, what I love about it, it says, immediately the boat was at land where they were going. It wasn't a random place. When you allow Jesus into your boat, into your storm, immediately you have access to get on the other side of that thing. As Christians, when you gave your life to Jesus, you tapped into a different nature. First Peter says, you tapped into a divine nature. It says you are now partakers of a divine nature. What does that mean? Every excuse you have about how your daddy was and how your mommy was, as valid as that might be, as much as that might have set you back, once you gave your life to Jesus Christ, all of a sudden you are a partaker of a divine nature. What does that mean? That means this, it doesn't matter what my mom did or my dad did, it doesn't matter how I started because when I gave my life to Jesus, I now have access to divinity, a divine nature. It is now in my DNA to overcome. It is now in my DNA to get to the other side. It is now in my DNA to no longer be stuck but to constantly get on the other side. You hear what I'm saying? So the excuse of where you came from and how you started, that's cool, that lasts for a little while. But at some point, when you understand who you are and you understand whose you are, you get to the other side. It might take some time, it might be a journey, it might be a process, but it is now in our nature to cross over. The Hebrews, they stand in front of the you know, the Israelites, they stand in front of the, the sea right there, the Red Sea, and the Egyptians are behind them. They're in an impossible situation. But because of their divine nature, the splee split open, and they walk through that thing. They cross over. Here's the thing, man. We are in a place where immediately, I believe, Jesus is going to hop in our boat. Things that took forever, immediately we're on the other side of those things. Let me share a couple more things. We're almost done. Chris Valton, uh, he's been here before. He, he's uh, one of the pastors at, at Bethel. He preached a message. It's called Kairos Season. He talked about it being a Kairos moment. And if you've been here the last couple Sundays where I've ever been on the mic, I've been talking about this nonstop. Because I feel like this is where we are. We are in a Kairos moment. We are in an area, in a, a place of our lives where you have to position yourself for divine opportunity, divine intervention, these are the moments I believe we're in that suddenly things are going to change. So number one, Chris Valton said this. He said the season would be marked by three things. Number one was acceleration. Things that took years will happen suddenly. Now my wife and I, we've been married for almost 10 years in August. Uh, and when we first got married, she had this house uh, like on Craig and Tanea, right across from like Popeye's Chicken. And so we lived like right across the street from there and we lived there and that, at that time the market, like that's when the market just went like took a dump. And so we're in there and we end up like short selling that house and we ended up moving in with some really great roommates, Paul and Denise. Really great. Man, you guys would love them. You guys would love them. They're cool. And so we lived with them. Then we moved into this other house and then I went to film school uh, and then we moved back with our roommates because we just loved them so much and we wanted to take care of them. We want to take care of them. They're getting older, you know? We want to just be there for them. So we're in back in with our roommates. And then we, we just recently, last year, we bought this other house. And it was amazing. It was a, honestly, it was a miracle house. We, we believe that. It was a miracle house. But no one tells you when you need a miracle that there's a lot of things that have to, like, go wrong before you, like, actually. So we moved into this house. And I've been here for 20 years. I've never seen a scorpion in my whole life. When we moved into that house, there must have been like 30 or 40 that I saw. Like they were everywhere. My wife would like lift up my kids' toys and a scorpion would come like crawling out. I'm like, this place is demonic, man. <laughs> and then to top it all off, like when I'd have a day off, I would like mow the lawn and stuff. It would take me four hours to mow that lawn. It was huge. I'm like pushing the lawnmower and I have to like take the bag out and dump it and then come back and then it was crazy. And then I'd blow the dry, it took me forever. And I went there the other day and Norman Pasquale's uh, father, father, pa Norma's uncle is riding on a tractor mowing. The I looked at him like, oh my gosh, I've never been so mad at someone in my heart. I'm like, bro, I pushed that grass for, um, and he's just like riding his lawnmower. You dirty dog. 
So we moved to that house last year and it was, it was just one story and it was laid out so strange for us, for my family, it was six of us in there. Now me and my wife have produced four babies. So six of us, that's right, four of them. And so me and my wife and my four kids were all in this house and it's like everyone's constantly on top of each other because there's so many of us. You know, a lot of the youth will come and they'll show me like, hey, check this out, I made this video or I made this graphic. I'm like, that's real cool, dude, but I made life. I made this kid four times, you know? But we're all like on top of each other. It was just like, it wasn't what we thought. Then there's a leak in one of the pipes we have to move out. We're back in with our roommates again. Paul and Denise. Anyways, 10 years, just like not really even like feeling like there's a place that we're like, this is our home, you know? Constantly just whatever. And so I've been telling you guys the last two weeks, we put an offer on this house uh, on President's Day. Everything like flew through. Now my wife's in real estate and she's super hot. Um, so everything like, I just threw that part in just for fun. But everything like flew by. It like happened so quick. We made the offer two hours later or whatever. They call us and like, we accepted your offer. And then like everything just like got pushed so fast. And now we're in there and we're unpacking stuff. And my like, I have a like OCD side of me that's like, oh no, then there can be no crumbs. But I got four kids. So like I'll sweep stuff up and they just come behind me like throwing chips and stuff. You know what I mean? Like I can't keep up with it. But now we're in that. This is the point. Ten years of like, what are we doing, man? This is crazy. And Literally, suddenly, it turned around. Immediately, I felt like we're on the other side of this thing. Immediately. And this is the season we're in. Number two, I'm going to fly through the, ne the next two so we can get out of here. Number two, unusual occurrences. Things that never happen will happen against ridiculous odds. And Chris talked about this. Think about all the crazy things that happened just in sports last year. The Cubs won the World Series after 108 years of not winning. Ron hates that. He's booing that. He's a big uh, Cleveland fan. But the Cubs win it after 108 years. Now check this out. The, the Cavs, before I get to the Cavs, the Patriots. They come back. Yeah, I know. Sam, look at Sam. Sam is a Patriot. <laughs> and Chris. And Chris is a fan. You might not like the Patriots like me. But listen, in the Super Bowl, they came back from a deficit, I believe, that no team had ever come back from in the Super Bowl ever. And they played the first overtime game in Super Bowl history. Then the Cavaliers last year in the NBA Finals, you could be someone in here and you're like, I don't care about sports. I'm just telling you, there's some unusual thing. The Cavs, right? No NBA team has ever come back from a 3-1 deficit in the NBA Finals before. The Cavs do it. But not only do they do it, they do it against Steph Curry had shattered the three-point record last year. He was the first place three-point shooter in the whole league. The second place three-point shooter in the whole league, his teammate, Klay Thompson. Number one and number two are both on the same team. They're down 3-1 and they come back and win the NBA Finals. There is unusual occurrences happening. Guys, not only that, the dude who used to sit at a desk and say, you're fired, is our president. <laughs> Unusual occurrences. You hear what I'm saying? I, this isn't uh, whatever. All I'm saying is unusual things have happened. And like it or not, you have to pray for him now. I, I'm just saying, I'm not, whatever your thought was, whatever you voted, whoever, whatever, now you got to pray for the dude. Unusual things. This is where we're stepping into. Number three, last one. Can we all stand up? We're gonna end here. Come on. Thank you guys. Number three, supernatural interventions. Kairos moments marked by three things. Number one, acceleration. Number two, unusual occurrences. Number three, supernatural interventions. The way things come about make no earthly sense. I believe we're in a season where supernatural things are going to happen. I believe some of you guys are going to get out of debt supernaturally. I honestly believe that. I believe Aunt Susie out of nowhere is going to just be like, I feel like giving you a whole bunch of money, whatever. You, you guys ever watch Oprah when she would like give stuff away? You get, a, you get a bed, you get a bed, you get a bed, you get whatever. I feel like, man, supernaturally, heaven is like the Oprah show. 
You're debt free, you're debt free, you're debt free. You get a house, you get a house, you get a car. This is the place we're stepping into. Supernatural intervention, man. I really believe this. Breakthrough, things that took years. Jesus is gonna hop in your boat immediately you're on the other side. And this is how I wanna end this. If you feel like, man, I've been in a storm and I wanna find God in that storm. And number two, if you feel like I want to step into that season of suddenly and immediately, can you come to the altar? And if you have your family here, bring your family here. Begin to pray for your wife. Begin to pray for your kids. Whatever it is, if that's you, one, you're in a storm. Two, you say, I want to step into that season of suddenly. Step into that season of immediately. Come up front. We're going to sing together. We're going to worship together. Let's do it.